The following program was a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. Welcome to Community Keynotes. This program was recorded at the Fairfax County Public Schools second annual Community Conversation on Teen Stress. Dr. Mark Brackett, director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, was one of the keynote speakers at the event. He spoke on emotional intelligence and how it drives learning, decision-making, relationships, and mental health in both children and adults. Uh, my talk is about emotional intelligence. And um, we're gonna start off by asking you how you're feeling. This is one of our tools. We call it the mood meter. And the mood meter has two axes. We call it the pleasantness axis and the energy axis. On the pleasantness axis, you are thinking in your mind's eye that today is gonna be a good day or a bad day. Minus five, which is the left side of pleasantness, you're thinking to yourself right now, I can't believe. I got to listen to a guy from Connecticut talk about feelings for an hour. <laughs> and from some of your facial expressions, I think you might be there. <laughs> Minus three, you're thinking this is going to be like every other presentation. You know, kind of boring. Maybe you're at neutral, like most people I know. You ask them how they feel, sort of like, hmm. No words, just sort of like, whatever. Maybe you're at plus three. like. You can't believe you get to spend a Saturday morning with a guy from Connecticut to talk about emotions. Yeah. But wait, we haven't gotten to plus five yet. <laughs> or maybe we're at plus five and there are no words in the English language dictionary to describe that level of pleasantness. All right. I can't make any promises to bring you there. I'd like you to take a moment though and seriously ask yourself, where are you on this dimension? Where are you right now? Did you wake up saying, this is going to be a great day? Or did you wake up saying to yourself, you know what? It's not going to be such a great day. Plus five, minus, minus. This is a reflection, by the way. Minus five to plus five. Next is your energy. So energy has to do with the amount of activation in your body. Minus five would mean that you are feeling like you are in the deepest pool of despair you're being pulled to the ground. Plus five means that you have so much energy you can't contain yourself. I'm not noticing anybody there. <laughs> we, have, we just started, I'm gonna recognize that. Where are you in terms of your energy? Like, do you feel sapped, drained, or do you feel energized and activated? And next, I'm going to ask you to cross your axes to create the four quadrants. The four quadrants are obviously yellow, red, blue, and green. Yellow, high energy and pleasant. Raise your hand if you're there. Okay. Red, high energy but unpleasant. Anyone feeling there this morning? <laughs> All right. Everybody's looking around. Who's the angry one? <laughs> blue. <laughs> And I just went through puberty. Uh, <laughs> blue, low energy, unpleasant. Anybody feeling in the blue today? A little bit? It's okay. And green, pleasant but lower in energy. Always the people in the back, I don't know. <laughs> now, I'm gonna ask you a quick question, which is I'm gonna give you three seconds to convert where you plotted yourself to a word. I want the feeling word that best describes how you're feeling right now. You have three seconds. Two, one, freeze. Honest raise of hands. How many of you had some trouble finding the best word? Hands up high. Really high, like stretch it out. Everybody look around the room, please. So that's interesting, at least to me as a scientist. Why is it that I could say I'm in the yellow, the red, the blue, or the green, but when I say, well, how are you feeling? The word doesn't come out so easily. I'm going to ask you to take a moment. You can turn to a partner. You can turn to your other personality. And ask yourself with your partner, 
Why might it be that it's challenging to find the best word to describe your feelings? You have one minute, go ahead. So who feels they have um, a hypothesis? Why might it be? Yes. Because we don't have an emotion vocabulary. Could be, could be true. Yes. You have too big of an emotional vocabulary. Give me 50 words for the yellow. <laughs> All right, yes. Interesting. Okay, ask me how I'm feeling. Devastated. Yes. So sometimes maybe we don't want to respond to somebody's feelings. Right, what do you do with that? If you're not good doing fine or great, what do we do about it? The left side of the mood meter, people oftentimes associate it with negative. And the question is, are unpleasant emotions negative or are they just unpleasant? And I'm going to ask you the following question. So we're here for an hour. And the sweet spot for my presentation is somewhere around here. I can't, I'm not going to jump. Well, maybe I will. Like right there, between yellow and green. And, like, I don't need you to be in the high yellow, like running around manic, right? Like, emotions, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, that would not be appropriate for now. It's not time to go home and sit on your porch or sit and watch TV and relax. We're not going to be in the deep green. We want to be somewhere between yellow and green. That's the sweet spot. And my question to all of you is, what is your strategy for the next hour? What is your emotion regulation strategy? So when you start thinking, oh my God, after here, we're going out for dinner. No, no, you got to be here now. Or when you start thinking, oh my God, I got to hear this guy for another four or five minutes. I can't believe it. What are you going to do to boost your energy? So you have, now this is, I'm going to ask you to think about this on your own. <laughs> Take 30 seconds and I want to hear from you. What is your strategy? Think about it. What is your emotion management strategy? Go ahead. Okay, let's come back together. Who feels like they've got a good strategy? Miss with the white. I think that a lot of people try to focus on what you're Just don't think about being hungry or tired. <laughs> Just say, I'm going to focus on the presenter. Okay, what's your strategy? Any subject, and especially I'm a Toastmaster, so I teach a lot of communication skills. So, what's your strategy? Yeah, for my strategy is to tell my all my students, including myself, before you wake up in the twilight zone, you think what do you wanted to do today. If it's a miserable day, you still think there's a better way to deal with. If you have a pleasant day, that's even better. You can influence others to be positive. That's what we have a positive strategy. Okay, so you're going to think about being positive. So let's think about this for a minute. I'm a teacher, and I come into my classroom, and my kids are all over the place because they're tired. How many of you have been tired in school? How many of you have been bored in school? How many of you have been stressed in school? How many have been frustrated in school? Okay, so we have all these emotions, and they come in, bored, tired, stressed, frustrated, and I say, kids, guys, girls, just... Just focus on what I say. <laughs> and I'm sure it's going to be a great day. <laughs> How many of you think that's going to be effective? <laughs> or I just say, you know what, everybody, I know it's been a, we've had a really tough time, a lot of stuff going on. Just stay positive. <laughs> because when you're positive, all the possibilities exist. How many of you think that all of a sudden every kid in your classroom is going to be positive? 
Sometimes people like to say, well, I do mindfulness. I want to be, I just stay in the present moment. So imagine I'm a high school teacher and I walk into my class of 30 and I say, you know what? We got a lot going on. We got test prep. And when you get distracted, when those weird thoughts come into your mind about going there and doing that, just come to the present moment. <laughs> there is no past. There is no future. <laughs> There's only the here and now. That's all there is. Relish it. Live in it. How many of you believe that, that all of a sudden every student is going to be focused and attentive? What do you think? They might laugh. So we need to really get detail-oriented when it comes to emotion management. Really, what are the specific skills that we have to develop? I spent 20 years of my life thinking about emotion management. I still, oftentimes I do something that if I'm really annoyed at somebody, I take a deep breath and I'm, I still hate you. Right? <laughs> so just taking a breath doesn't necessarily shift the way you think, right? Everybody rise. Please rise. Levantanse. I'd like everyone to please get comfortable in their stance. Good posture, you'll live longer. I have no research to support that, but <laughs> you'll look better anyway. And I want us to take a little bit of a roller coaster ride. If you are a student, I'm going to ask you to think about your typical day. If you are a parent or an administrator or a teacher, I want you to think about a student who you know. Okay? That's it. Maybe think about a child that you know who has had a little bit of a difficult year. And I'm going to ask you right now to live vicariously through that child or yourself if you're a student. Please take a nice long inhale and an exhale. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. The alarm is probably going off. It's time to wake up. How do you feel? This is a reflection again. So we have to work on impulse control in Virginia. <laughs> So this is a quiet reflection. I'm asking you to go inside. You're visualizing this person. We'll start again. It's 5.30 in the morning. The alarm goes off. How does the child feel? How do you feel? Time to have breakfast, no breakfast. Healthy breakfast, unhealthy breakfast. How do you feel at breakfast? It's time to commute to school. How does the commute feel? Is it a friendly commute, unfriendly commute? Are you feeling lonely? Are you feeling excited? Are you feeling optimistic? Are you feeling frustrated? Or are you already bored? You walk into your school. How do you feel when you walk into your school? When you look around and you see other students, how does this child feel? Classroom one, two, three, four, math, language arts, science, pre-calculus, calculus, trigonometry, whatever it is. How does that child feel in each of these different classes? Lunchtime, sitting alone or with others. How do you feel when you're having lunch? How does this student feel? Afternoon classes and more classes, test prep, social studies, language arts, more classes. How does that student feel? How do you feel in those afternoon classes? After school, after school program, no after school program. Wandering around by yourself, wandering around with others. Doing productive activities or not? How do you feel in the afternoon? How do you feel when you walk out of the school? Are you thinking to yourself, this is going to be a fantastic evening? Or, oh, I've got to go home, I can't believe it. Or, relieved that you're out of the building. It's dinner time. What's going on at dinner? Conversation, no conversation, isolation, togetherness. How do you feel? Evening time, homework, more homework, more homework, no homework. How do you feel? It's time to go to sleep. You put your head on the pillow. What emotions are going on in your brain? Are you thinking to yourself, I cannot wait to get up in the morning. Tomorrow is going to be an even better day than today. Or are you thinking to yourself, Gosh, I wish I could sleep an extra two hours. I really wish I didn't have to go to school tomorrow. How do you feel at night? I'm going to ask you to turn to a partner and take 30 seconds each. You can do a small group if you want and just share. What are or is that list of emotions that you think 
the child is feeling. If you're a student, I'd like to know what is your experience like? You got one minute each. Go ahead. Just for curiosity, how many of you, when you're thinking about yourself or the student, were thinking that a lot of the feelings were on the left side of the mood meter? Unpleasant. Raise your hand. So about 80% of you. How many of you saw mostly every pleasant feelings? Raise your hand. Five people. <laughs> So that leads to some interesting questions, doesn't it? And from our perspective, emotions matter, and they matter a great deal. And the work that I do and the science that I do really focuses on five primary areas of why emotions matter. The first is attention, memory, and learning. So you're seeing me now at 45 years old as a professor, martial arts teacher, but when I was 13 and 14 years old, I was a kid living in New Jersey who was awkward, who was not athletic, who was bullied horrifically. So I had a pretty hard childhood. I had two older brothers. One of them had mental illness. The other one had physical illness. My mother was very focused on her other sons who had these problems. I was left pretty much on my own and um, had some bullying problems, like serious bullying problems, from physical abuse to name calling to you name it. And it's very interesting as I look back and reflect on those experiences, I don't remember an adult ever asking me how I felt. Never. I don't remember anyone reading my facial expressions and saying something like, you know, it looks like there might be something wrong. You want to talk about it? Maybe you need some support. It just didn't happen. What's also interesting is that I have no memory of anything that I learned in middle school. And why is that? It's because my brain was preoccupied with safety. My brain was preoccupied with relationships. My brain was preoccupied with worrying about how I'm going to get home without being bullied or hurt. And when your brain is preoccupied with those kinds of things in life, it can't be available to learning. So it's pretty darn clear that the areas of our brain associated with stress, when they're activated in that fight or flight mode all the time, the areas of our brain that are associated with learning get turned off. The second is decision-making and judgment. How many of you, when you were thinking about that student who is maybe having a lot of red and blue emotions, can acknowledge that that child may not be making the best choices? That those feelings are guiding the decisions that child is making, the judgments they're making. How many of you have made a bad decision in the last year? <laughs> Turn to your partner and share. <laughs> um, we know that emotions drive our judgments and decision-making. So I do research on teachers as well. And in my studies of teachers, what I've shown, and I apologize for telling you this research, is that I have randomly assigned teachers to go into rooms and just think about a good versus a bad day and write about it for five minutes. Pretty simple. And then after they do that, I ask them to grade papers. You guys are going to go on a protest now. How many of you believe that how the teacher feels biases the grades? How many of you want to go into denial about this? <laughs> so what we know from our research is that there's a full one to two grade difference in the way teachers evaluate based on their mood state. The third is relationship quality. Does anyone here have a relative that is very difficult to be around? Like someone who like generates a lot of negativity. Anybody know like that? They show a lot of these kind of facial expressions. Anybody know anybody like that? Like why would you want to do that? Or this kind of thing? Like you gotta be kidding me. That's where you want to go to school? You really? Who are you joking? Anybody know anybody like that? And how many of you, when you really like put them into your mind's eye, say to yourself? That's who I want to go on vacation with. <laughs> we don't, right? We don't want to be around people that display a lot of negativity because emotions are signals. They are signals to come toward or to go against. They are signals that I am approachable. 
This is a genuine smile, right? Has anyone ever seen a fake smile? I love that one, the politician smile. Good to see you. How many of you, when you look at that, you're like, are you kidding me? So emotions are signals. They're signals that things are going right, that they're going wrong. They're signals to approach, to avoid. The fourth is physical and mental health, and I know that we care a lot about that here. If you don't have the words to describe your feelings, how do you know what to do with them? How do you even know how you're feeling? If you don't know that in the blue quadrant of the mood meter, you can go from feeling down to disappointed to hopeless to despair, or in the red quadrant, you go from feeling peeved or irritated to angry to livid to enraged, or in the yellow, you might go from being pleased to happy to joyful to elated to ecstatic, or in the green, you might go from calm to content to relax to tranquil to bliss. If you don't have that granularity in terms of your self-awareness, how do you know what to do with your feelings? And what we say in our center is that if you can name it, you can tame it. If you can't name it, it's very hard to know what to do with it. What's also important is that we need strategies. Telling someone to calm down, telling someone to take a deep breath. I'll never forget this. I was on a train. I, I, live in, I go to New York quite a bit, and I used to live there. And I was on the train. I teach a course every year at Columbia University for leaders of schools. And we're driving, or we're taking the train down from 125th Street to the... the um, to the train station to get home. And there's a mom sitting with her kind of teenage son who is not behaving, I would say in, in the mother's language, not using train behavior. Okay. <laughs> so we all know we have like behavioral expectations. So this kid is now on the train, like, you know, getting up and walking around. And mother says, son, you need to sit next to me. Right, train behavior. Right, okay, fine. I'm like loving this thing. So now we're at 96th Street, and the kid gets up again, right, looking around, watching people. Son, mommy says sit. Now he has become a dog, right? right? <laughs> mommy says sit, right? You need to sit. Now the kid, it's like 86th Street, up and wandering around. Now the mom is really activated. Any parents ever been activated, <laughs> right? So now it goes something like this. Look at me. When mommy speaks, look at me. Eye contact, right? Focus. Eye contact, I need you to sit, right? 79th Street, right? I'm like sitting there thinking, my goodness, this is this child's everyday life. I was getting aroused and like feeling tense about it. And then we got to like 72nd Street, it was like, you know, I was starting to get the shakes myself and I was thinking, what can I do to help this family out? Honestly, the only thing I could think of was writing a little note to the kid and say, you know, run away now uh, because it was like, I don't know what to do about this. It's like unbelievable, right? How much stress parents go through, right? How difficult it is for us to regulate our feelings when we're not, you know, getting the expectations out of the kids. So the point here is that we need to teach very specific skills to manage emotions. And if we don't develop those skills, oftentimes anger leads to enraged. Sadness leads to depression. If we teach children and the adults who raise them to be more able to identify these feelings, maybe we can regulate them earlier on in the phase and not wait until everything's exploded. And that leads me to the fifth piece, piece which is everyday effectiveness. You know, I've had the privilege of working in well over a thousand schools in my career. I've traveled to probably 30 countries from Myanmar to Australia to Japan to Croatia to Italy, Spain, Virginia, <laughs> it's a little boring just saying. <laughs> and it's interesting, there's a movement that's happened in the last three years in schools, and I'm calling it the perseverance movement. That it's all about focus, and it's all about having grit, right? If you have grit, you're gonna make it in life. And I'm gonna tell you that I am the anti-grit guy. Um, I think that it is a very misguided way of thinking about child development. And the reason why I say that is that not everybody wants to be a leader. I hate to tell you this, but not everybody wants to be the CEO of a company. Some people have the personalities and some people want other things in their life aside from work. And what I found in schools that focus on this perseverance factor 
is that they fail to understand the emotion management factor. So I'm going to give you an example. When I went into karate um, at 13, because my parents didn't really know how to help me. They were lovely parents, but it gets better. It doesn't work for, for, some, you know, for me. I'm not really an it gets better kind of guy. I'm like, I want help now. Um, <laughs> Like, think about when you're in college, Mark, it'll all be fine. It's like, I'm 13 years old, Mom. Like, I'm not sure that's a good strategy. Um, so I go into martial arts. Now I'm going to be a tough guy. And as you can see, it really worked well. <laughs> um, and I go into the karate studio, and I am now, like, you know, really focused. I'm blocking punches, and I'm kicking. I'm doing all that stuff. And I go, and I take my yellow belt test. I want to get a yellow belt. That's gonna make me a real man. And I failed my yellow belt test. So here I am, a kid who's being bullied in school, not really getting the attention he needs at home, go into karate, fail the yellow belt test. I go home, I am devastated. I am hopeless. I hate school, I hate karate, I'm not going back, I can't take it, I'm crying, I hate school, I hate karate, I'm not going back, I hate school, I hate karate, I'm not going back, I hate school, I hate karate, I'm not going back. You're my parent. What's your strategy? You have one minute. What is your strategy to help me manage that feeling? Go. Okay, time. Who feels like they have a good strategy? Honestly, what would you do? How many of you feel confident? Raise your hand if you feel confident that you can help me manage my emotions effectively. Raise your hand. No one feels confident? So I really have a career. This is great. What were you going to say, sir? So I, you know, I think you're, I mean, you're freaking Daddy, out. Daddy, I hate karate. Right? I'm not going back. You're, you're, you're freaking Daddy, out, Daddy, right? don't talk to me like that. Tell me what to do. I'm, really, I'm freaking out. I'm, I'm not going back to karate. What I would probably do is give you a bowl of ice cream. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right, next. Who wants to take it on? Anybody want to take it on? This, this woman right here in the green. Okay. Mommy, I hate karate. I'm not going back. I can't stand it. I can't stand okay. it. I'm not going back. Nobody likes me. I'm embarrassed. I'm humiliated. People are making fun of me. My, I can't even make it in karate. I forget about it. Oh, man. Tell, sit down. Do you want to hug? I don't want to sit down. Okay. Do you want to go for a run? What? You want to go out and run and pound the pavement because maybe getting that energy out will help. Or do you want to sit and talk with me? <laughs> All right. I'm going to go play Wii and, and I'm going to put on boxing if you want to join me. Come on. What are you going to do? Boxing. Boxing? On the Wii. You want to hit somebody? Yes. <laughs> Next. What? What do you want me to do? I can't take it anymore. I'm still, I can't take it anymore. I'm not going to school tomorrow. Nobody's going to play with me. People, they got the yellow belt. They get the yellow belt. They're not going to want to be with me. They're okay. going to make fun of me. I understand that you're um, what really do you mean upset and angry about this. I, I understand that. So you don't, you don't have to go to karate right away. That's okay. What do you mean? Are we quit already? No, you're not quitting. We're just taking a break. Just maybe this week, and then we'll see how you're doing. And how am I going to go back? They're still going to make fun of me. We it's okay. We don't have to think about next year. Just, just now. Just like, you know, this week. Take a break. See how you're feeling. Maybe things will shift. And I understand know? that you're upset know? right now. It must be hard for you. Yeah, I understand that. That's okay. I understand. What do you understand? It must be hard. It must be very hard. What do you mean you understand? You're not 13 years old. You, don't, you're not, you never took karate. How do you know? <laughs> I've been a teenager. <laughs> I know. All right, so I'm not going to push this too much. And how many of you realize that it's really hard? Anyone want to at least acknowledge it? It is tough. Now, what I'm interested in is no one asked, no one said, come on, let me give you a hug. Who did? Somebody did? Raise your hand if you were going to give me a hug. So five people. <laughs> All right, now you're saying, oh, I would have done that now that I think about it. Now, do we even know, did anybody ask me, son, how are you feeling? We had ice cream, which is fine, maybe for the short run, 
But ice cream is not going to help me get my yell about, right? It might. Let's think about this. What are the skills, what are the strategies that we need as the adults who are raising children, as the teachers who are raising children, for ourselves to manage our lives? And it's not easy. It requires an emotion education. And when we think about adolescence, right, we know that the teenage brain is different. We just do, right? Teenagers, just so you know, you know this already, I'm just telling you everything you know about yourselves, right? Want more, uh, easier ways to gain rewards, difficult to focus on goals oftentimes, take greater risks, have more car crashes, experiment with more drugs, commit more crimes, have more intended pregnancies, are more likely to drop out of school. I mean, this is a decades of research on adolescence. It's abundantly clear. And I think to many, right, teenagers, right, appear to be illogical, poor decision makers, even sometimes invincible. I can do anything. Um, and the truth is, sometimes, and some of you can, for sure, but there are biological differences that happen in puberty. Puberty is like no other time in development. Adolescence is like no other time in development. Right, there's the onset of puberty, there are brain areas responsible for balancing emotions, except they're not working. So if you do something like, if you take your thumb and put it inside your fingers like that, that would be your brain. This is kind of your emotion center. This is your kind of decision-making judgment center, the top part. They're not communicating very well in adolescence. Just biologically that way. It's not that it's abnormal. It's just that it's developing as a system and they're not yet developed. We know that peers have a strong influence. So I know, for example, in my work, I've done uh, for the last two years, I've been a consultant to Facebook and Instagram and have built systems for them to help kids who have had bullying situations on them. Interestingly enough, 95% of teenagers refuse to go to a family member when they're having a bullying incident. Why? Because they want the individuation. They want to, say, they want to solve it on their own. They want to just deal with it. But yet, we may not necessarily have the skills to deal with it. And that's where the discrepancy and the challenge lies. They want for acceptance. It's part of growing up. And obviously, I think, as we all know in many of our schools here, that the expectations for adolescents have shifted dramatically. So the question, is there anything that we can do? And I hope that you will be on my page and say there is. Right? So I'm sure many of you as parents of teenagers feel like you should just lock your kids up until they, their brains mature. Can't do that. Sorry. Um, what we know is that adolescence is actually an age of opportunity. It's an opportunity to build social and emotional skills. It's an opportunity to engage kids in creative processing. It's an opportunity to teach complex problem solving, to build a purpose and passion in life, and to maintain positive relationships. And so what my center does at Yale is we have spent 20 years studying adolescent development, 20 years working in school systems, 20 years working with parents and teachers and school leaders. And our vision is to use the power of emotional intelligence to create a more healthy, effective, and compassionate society. And the way we do that is through continuously doing research, but really going into schools and developing systems and practices that can be sustainable. So the big question is that emotions matter. What are the skills that we need to teach? And there are five skills of emotional intelligence. The first is recognizing emotions. The second is understanding emotions. The third is labeling emotions. The fourth is expressing, and the fifth is regulating. And we call those the ruler skills. So we'll go through them in, in detail. First one, identifying emotion in oneself and others by interpreting facial expressions, body language, vocal tones, and physiology. So think about this. For every emotion, from happy to sad, to anger to fear, to right to disgust, there are patterns. There's a physiological pattern. There is a cognitive pattern. There is an expression. The second is understanding emotions, knowing the causes and the consequences of emotions in terms of how they affect our thinking, our judgment, our behavior. That certain moods are better for doing certain things than other moods. We'll get into this in more detail in a moment. The third is labeling emotions, having the right vocabulary. So we're going to do a little test in here right now. You have 30 seconds. I want to know from someone in the audience what the difference is between anger and disappointment. What is the actual difference between the two? What is the difference of what causes people to feel angry versus disappointed? Go.
Okay, time is up. These are simple words, right? Anger, disappointment. Who's confident? Who can explain to me the psychological difference of what makes people feel angry versus disappointment? You do? For which one? And then what about disappointment? Um, just not meeting a goal. Okay. Yes. Here, I'm in this emotion. Oh, sorry. Like I'm here and I'm in this emotion if I'm angry, like the sympathetic nervous system. And then, um, what was the other one? Disappointment. Okay, disappointment uh, would be something reflective. So maybe the parasympathetic nervous system. So, you know, I've experienced that emotion and now I'm reflecting on it. And now I'm just disappointed. Hmm. Huh. Okay. Yes. I say angry is outward emotion, and um, disappointment is inward emotion. Okay. So we're getting lots of ideas out here. The primary difference between the two is that disappointment is about unmet expectations. I thought I was going to get the yellow belt. I didn't get it. That leads to disappointment. It leads to feeling down, hopeless maybe. Whereas if I think that my martial arts teacher sabotaged me intentionally, I'm not disappointed, I am. I'm angry because of that injustice that someone was talking about, unfairness. So they're very different. How many of you believe that some of our adolescents show one way, like they look like they're angry, but they're feeling another one? Right? We act out our anger or our disappointment because we, wanna, we don't want to show we're disappointed. So what we're happening, or what we're doing in many cases, is we're managing the behavior, not the feeling. And in our work, unless you get deeper inside to the actual emotional experience, you're not going to know what to do with it. And that leads to knowing how to express emotions, right? being comfortable with the full range of emotions. And there are three levels to that. There are individual differences. So as you, you know me now a little bit, I mean 40 minutes, I'm pretty comfortable with expressing my feelings. About a, uh, two months ago, I have two older brothers, and I invited them. I was giving a talk in New York City, and I said, come on, guys, you've got you to see your brother. You don't even know what I do. You just think I sit in coffee shops and think all day. <laughs> and I said, come here, your brother, give a speech. Come on. So my brothers come in. They're sitting, like, right here, front row. And at the beginning, they're like, wow, like, really into my presentation. About halfway through, I see them looking at each other like, and at the end of my presentation, I jump off the stage and I'm like, so what do you think, guys? And my one brother looked at me and he goes, you shamed our family. <laughs> right? And I said, what do you mean I shamed our family? He's like, you disclosed too much. People are going to think we're weak. I'm like, I don't know. Everybody was applauding. So like, I don't know what's going on with you, but it was fine for me. And, you know, so my brother, one of them is a little inhibited. He's a little lonely. He's a significant other, but that's a whole other story. Um, there are individual differences. We are, each of us has a comfort level. Some of us are very out with our emotions, some of us are more in with our emotions. The second is that there are social norms. I know that you've got, what, 200 schools in this district. My hunch is that every school has its own little feeling. You walk into it, this one feels this way, that one has that feeling. That's a climate. And the third is culture that there are larger cultural norms. Like when I go to Korea to do my martial art, right, there are different rules in South Korea, very different rules in terms of eye contact, in terms of engaging in conversation, just very different. And we need to be aware of all those to be emotionally skilled. The fifth skill is regulating emotions, knowing the strategies, how and when. Do I use a thought strategy or do I use an action strategy? So right now, imagine I'm feeling like completely overwhelmed. It's a little warm in here. Everybody's a little bit distracted. Everybody's freaking out. I'm not worried. This, I'm like, my sense of humor doesn't work in Virginia. People are kind of like this. And I can, I'm going to, you know, I'm freaking out, everybody. I'm like having a lot of anxiety right now. I'm just going to like, I need to be on my own. I'm sorry. Just do your thing. And I just start doing yoga, right? And I just, you know, I'm sorry. I just, I'm really stressed out. I need balance. <laughs> oh. Okay. Now, I can't really do that, can I? I can't just start doing yoga when I'm running a meeting at my university. Excuse me, President Salave. I, I'm like stressed out right now. Do you mind if we take a yoga break? <laughs> now, you can do that once in a while. 
But when I'm here and I'm noticing, let's say, this is not the case, but let's just say this guy over here is doing something like this during my talk. <laughs> Has anyone ever had someone roll their eyes at them? <laughs> and what do you want to do? I mean, you want to just like, ah! But you can't do that. You've got to manage it in here. Right? You've got to deal with it here. It's very interesting because this area of emotion management has become, you know, my strongest interest. And as, as you know, I do a lot of traveling. And I was coming back from a trip from Australia just about two months ago. And I was in Chicago trying to get home and I missed my plane. And if you know what it feels like when you've been away for three weeks and you want to get home and your plane has been canceled, it was like unbearable. Like to the point where you're like emotionally drained, you feel depleted of all your resources. And I'm in Chicago airport like running to try to, get, can I get in the last flight? Can I, can I switch? I'll do anything I can. Take every, all my points. I don't care. I want home. I want home. I want home. And they said, no, nope, sorry, it's not going to happen. You're gonna, you have to stay in a hotel tonight. And at that moment, I was freaking out. Like I literally felt for the first time in probably 30 years that I was going to have a panic attack. I wanted to be home so, so, so bad. I couldn't deal with it. And it was interesting to me because I felt my heart racing, I felt my body getting all tense and hot, I felt my brain saying all these negative things about how I hate to fly and I hate people and I hate the airlines and I hate everybody and why am I doing this in my life? I have no career, I'm a, I'm, I'm a bad decision maker. Has anyone ever been in that place? <laughs> and then, you know, I'm lucky, right? I have strategies. I actually know breathing exercises, I know mindfulness activities, I know how to engage in positive reappraisal. So in that moment, I was able to manage my emotion. It wasn't easy. It took me 10 minutes to just figure it out. And as I was walking to my hotel, I was thinking to myself, what is it like for our nation's youth? Because when I was 13, I didn't have those strategies. When I was five, I didn't have those strategies. When I was 15, when I was 20, when I was 25, I didn't have those strategies. And how if I didn't have the language and I didn't have the strategies, how different my experience would have been in that moment. And it really reunited my purpose in this work, that I'm a 45-year-old man who has a PhD in psychology, you know, a black belt in the martial arts, spent six, I wrote six curriculum on social and emotional learning, and I'm having trouble regulating? What does that mean for the rest of the world in terms of their ability to regulate? And it helps us think about how do we move from yelling to deep breathing, from negative talk to positive talk, from blaming to reframing, from procrastination to achieving goals, from rumination to positive visualizations, from avoiding to finding support from others, from excessive drinking to problem solving? And if you look at the column on the left, what you'll notice is that those are very, you don't need to go get your degree in psychology or counseling or social work. They come to us without even asking. Right? It's so easy to just say, go blank yourself. It's so easy to just say, you know what, I'm not good at anything, I'm a loser, nobody likes me, I'm never going to make it. It's so easy to just say, you know what, that was your fault. It was your fault. Blaming other people. It's so easy to just procrastinate. We just ruminate and just you know, go on and on and on, obsessing about things. It's easy to avoid. It's easy to just have another beer, another alcoholic beverage. Those are easy. If you look at the ones on the right, they take effort. They take intentionality. They take knowledge, they take skills. So, what we know from our research is that adolescents with higher skills in this area of recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing, regulating, they have less anxiety, they have less depression, they're less likely to abuse drugs, alcohol, and cigarettes, they're less aggressive and less likely to bully others. We know that adolescents with higher ruler skills have greater leadership skills, they are more attentive and less hyperactive, and guess what? They outperform students in academics. We know that teachers with more developed emotional skills are more positive about teaching. They receive more support from their principals. They report greater job satisfaction and less stress. We even know that classrooms, we go in and we videotape classrooms and look at the interactions between and among teachers and students. Guess what? Classrooms are more engaged when they have higher emotional intelligence. They have students who report better relationship with their teachers, decreased or increased, I should say, pro-social behavior, and higher academic performance. So over and over again, whether it be at the teacher level, the student level, or the classroom level, those with greater emotional intelligence perform better. And that leads us to the last piece, which is can you teach this stuff? 
because there are models that say, you know what, this is all biological. Is it nature or is it nurture? So the nature piece is the following, right? How many of you are like me? You worry. Does anybody here worry? How many of you worry about why you worry? <laughs> right? I actually have a new thing. I worry about why I worry about why I worry. Because I don't really have anything to worry about, but it's like the default. Like, you know, worry about it because go, something will go wrong. Not a great place to be in your brain. Luckily, I have those skills. Now, I was also brought up in a family. How many of you were brought up by somebody? <laughs> right. How many of you were brought up by wolves? <laughs> You know, we have nurture. So I grew up in a family where my mother was very worried all the time. So my mother, I would say, Mom, it's not going to work out for me. I think I'm not going to make it. And she'd say something like this. Don't tell me I'll have a breakdown. <laughs> right? And I remember thinking to myself, you're going to have a breakdown? Like, I'm the one being bullied. <laughs> but in 20 years, Mom, I will have a program for you. Um, my father was the type, get to your room, wait till your mother gets home. Great, so she'll have a breakdown. Right? <laughs> And so they didn't have strategies. They were lovely people. They just didn't have skills. They didn't know how to manage their own emotions. They didn't know how to help me manage mine. And that's why we need a system. We need to create systems in schools where from preschool to graduation to university throughout life, we're developing these skills. And I want you to take a moment and think about your emotion education. Be honest with yourself. How sophisticated was your emotion education? What did you learn about recognizing emotions? Did you grow up in a family where in the morning you woke up and your mother, like you had a little nervous face and you, maybe you're at breakfast and you're talking about the day. Oh my goodness, honey, I'm noticing that you have like, your eyes are pulled back. Oh my goodness, honey, are you feeling nervous? Or maybe it's apprehension. No, 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 it's not. It must, are you overwhelmed? Oh no, no, it might, it might be some anxiety about the uncertainty. Oh, so it's, it's apprehension. Okay, honey, let me give you a research-based strategy to help you regulate. <laughs> How many of you grew up in a family like that? Or get over it, right? That's what I grew up with. Why would you be sad about that? Why would that make you sad? That doesn't bother me. Great. Love that empathy. So the question is, what do we do? What do we do? And I'm going to wrap up with sharing you just a little bit about what we do. In our approach, we call RULER, which stands for the five skills of emotional intelligence, we start working with schools with a set of tools. And the first tool we call the Emotional Intelligence Charter, and it says, you know what, let's move away from rules all the time, like don't do this and don't do this. Why don't we talk about the emotions that we want to experience? How do we want to feel when we're in school? It's very interesting, I was in Seattle. I'm working with the entire district of Seattle Public Schools. And I went into a fifth grade classroom and it was unbelievable to me. They had their beautiful charter on emotional intelligence, and one of the words in the charter was selfless. Selfless. So I'm a scientist, I, don't, I, I disprove everything. So I go to a kid in the class, and I said, selfless? I didn't know what that word meant until I was 40 years old. And he goes, yes, selfless is our word this year, one of our words for our charter. I said, really? He goes, yeah, and I was like, how'd you come up with the word selfless? And he looks at me like this, he goes, sir, everybody in our school is narcissistic. <laughs> and he goes, we decided as a class that we're gonna focus on other people this year, not ourselves. Like, Where am I? <laughs> it's unbelievable. So that charter, right, is this. This is a woman, her name is Dawn DaCosta. She is the principal of a school in Harlem, New York, one of the most challenging areas of Harlem she has transformed her school. She has no rules in her school. In her school, they want to feel supported, appreciated, peaceful, interested, empowered, understood, appreciated, and motivated. And then they work with each other as the leaders of the school, educators and staff, on what are you going to do to create those feeling states? Think about it. The classroom level. Fifth grade, right, we want to feel included, confident, respected, appreciated. This is a high school, respected, supported, comfortable, and spirited. The next tool we call the mood meter. All of you know this tool because you've seen it already. What we have to teach people are what does it look like to be in each quadrant? What does it sound like to be in each quadrant? 
What does it feel like to be in each quadrant? What are the words? What are the actual emotion words? What are the strategies that we need to use to help us deal with our emotions in each quadrant? How do we get into the yellow? How do we get into the green? How do we get out of the blue? How do we stay comfortable in the blue? You know, it's interesting. There are psychologists today who all, uh, there's so many books on happiness and it drives me crazy because it can't just be about happiness, right? I lost my father last year. I lost my uncle who was my inspiration in my life, who was an educator who got me involved in this field. And it was very interesting. I was walking around my own university and it's a pretty good place where I work, just so you know. And I'm working with some psychologist in my department. He looks at me and he goes, I heard about your dad. I said, yeah. He goes, it's a good thing you teach those skills. <laughs> like, really? You're, like, you're a clinical psychologist? <laughs> Thank goodness. I don't need therapy anymore. And then I was in another, another place. I got a text message from my best friend from high school. Best friend. 30 years, friends. My condolences to you and your family. I'm like, a text message is what you sent to someone who lost their father, who you knew? You grew up with my dad. One of my other friends called my assistant, Kate, and said to her, you know, I don't want to bother Mark because I know he's going through a lot between work and the loss of his father. Just tell him I love him. I called this friend of mine. I said, all right, Janet, we've known each other for like ever. You're going to call my assistant to tell her to tell me she lo to love me? I mean, how, where are we with emotions in our country? I mean, think about it. It's like this repression, this inhibition about feeling or even expressing emotions. We need to move beyond that. So we've actually developed an app that you can use to teach yourself the mood meter. You can move your finger around it. You can describe why. You can say you want to shift. I want to get out of the blue. I'm not in the mood to be in the blue. I've got to give a talk. All right, what's your strategy? I want to get into the yellow. I'm going to look at my puppy. You can import images. You can import um, quotes. You can use our research-based strategies. And then you can look at the frequency. Of course, I look like I'm clinically depressed. Um, I'm not. Um, I just show people the blue a lot. <laughs> What's interesting about this work is that it matters for classroom level instruction as well. That emotions are driving student engagement. And that the best of us as educators know that we have to differentiate our instruction. That the yellow is great for brainstorming. You're, you're getting cards right now. So this year I've decided that I can't do this alone. And I partnered with Lady Gaga, the singer. And we, she and I are, have developed a campaign together that we're calling the Emotion Revolution. And in that campaign, we we're asking high school students around the nation to tell us how they feel in school. And we also want them to tell us how they hope to feel in school. And what we're going to do is look at the discrepancy between the current experience and the hoped for experience and really create a call to action to America to take seriously this discrepancy. Because it's just taking too long. Thank you. I can't do that on my own, right? I'm a schleppy psychologist. Like, nobody wants to listen to me. I don't have 500 million followers on Twitter and Facebook, right? She puts out a message, all of a sudden 10,000 people take the survey. I beg everybody I know to take it. Nobody wants to listen to me. So the yellow is great for brainstorming, getting ideas out there. The green, think about it. We've got to come together and agree on something. When you're in that yellow, you're like, everything's possible. The green is, okay, we can do this. The blue says, wait a minute, what's the budget? Right? Where's the resources? Like, by the way, I love this idea, but like, who's helping me? The red is interesting, because most people say, red, I don't want to be in the red. But the red is about persuasion, right? If you're, you want to persuade people to take your idea seriously, you can't always be in the yellow. Think about it. If I were here right now, and I'm going to end my presentation right now, and obviously go through this in more detail um, in my workshop later on, I can end my workshop saying something like this. Hey, everybody, my name is Mark Brackett. Like, I am just so delighted to be here. Like, look at these guys' faces. I mean, unbelievable. Don't we want to give them the strategies they need to succeed together? And you're like, not really. I can come in the green. My goodness. It's good to see you. And you. And you. I was thinking that we should end today with a breath because there really is just, there's just one breath. It's, 
It's our breath. Let's recognize the impermanence in our nation's education system together. I can come in the blue. I don't know if you know this, but our center's published 500 studies on the role of emotions. My hunch is that none of you've read them. <laughs> but there's hope, right? There is hope. Right? Just like every other education reform effort, there's hope. There's no change, but there's hope. <laughs> or maybe I need to come in in the red and say something a little different. I need to come in the red and say, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, my name is Mark Brackett, as you all know, and I'm a psychologist. And it's really interesting to me. There have been decades of research to show that a child's ability to regulate his or her emotions, the child who has that understanding of emotion, who has that ability to articulate clearly what is going on inside of them, they have better lives. They're healthier, they're happier, they're more effective. So when are we going to start taking seriously the social and emotional education of our youth? Because in my opinion, the research is there, the data are there. It's time to take seriously our nation's youth. Thank you very much. So which, which quadrant do you think makes sense? You got to be a little red. You can't be that bitter red. You got to be a persuasive red. So. I'm only, I'm just going to be, uh, I'm going to wrap up right now. What the research shows is that schools that adopt these practices, they have students who perform better academically, they have students who have greater mental health, they have classrooms that have more positive climates. I can't make an audacious claim in my conclusion, because I'm a scientist. I can't lie about the data. The data are coming together, they're pretty definitive. They're not perfect. That schools that take seriously children's social and emotional health have students who are healthier, they are more empathic, they have greater ability to manage the anxiety and stress associated with school, and most importantly, they can navigate their personal and social lives. So I hope that today was at least somewhat interesting to all of you, that you will join me in this emotion revolution, because um, we are taking this seriously. Our goal is to get one million youth across the United States to take this survey, so that we can show definitively that children's emotions matter. Thank you very much. For more information about the Community Keynote Series, please visit the Fairfax Network website.